Welcome back to The Look and Sound of Leadership, an ongoing series of executive coaching tips designed to help you be perceived in the workplace the way you want to be perceived. I'm Tom Henschel, your executive coach, and today we're talking about inviting dialogue. Arlen worried he wasn't making his points clearly with his direct reports. When I asked him to tell me more about that, he said, I'm always asking them, is that clear? And they say yes. But later it becomes obvious it wasn't clear at all. I don't know how much is me and how much is them. I asked, and is that what you ask them? Is it clear? Yeah, he said. Do you want me to explain it again or was that clear? Something like that. I asked, and what does clear mean? Do they understand? Do they know what they're supposed to do so they can go off and do it? Really? If they answered you, yes, sir, Arlen, sir, clear as a bell, sir, would that put your mind at rest? Sure would, he said. Oh, that's interesting. It wouldn't for me, I said. Well, it would for me. They're grown-ups. If they say yes, they should mean yes. Well, maybe they mean it at the time. Look, if you're my boss and you ask me, do I understand you, it's reasonable I might think yes is the right answer in the moment. Then, holding up my hand to stop the conversation, I said, I don't know if you want to get me started. (laughs) I can get really geeky about what happens in our brains when we hear open versus closed-ended questions. He looked a little blank. I said, Arlen, your spidey sense is telling you that your conversations with your direct reports could be better, right? I'm wondering if it's connected to the question you're asking. Do you want me to go down this road? Sure, go ahead, he said. I considered where to begin. After a pause, I said, Being a coach has taught me so much about how to be in conversation with people about very specific things. Like right now, you and I are having this very specific conversation about the power of questions. He gave a laugh. Whoa, that's meta. I said, So suppose at some point in this conversation, after we've talked about a bunch of things, I want to know what you've understood. And I ask, hey, Arlen, is this clear? Does this make sense to you? What do you imagine you might say? I don't know, he said. I might say yes. Right, I said. I think that's most people's first answer when they're asked a yes-no question. But I think we learn it as kids in school. When the teacher asks the class, boys and girls, do you understand? I mean, who's going to say no? Oh, someone might, he said. Well, yes, someone might, but it takes some courage. He smiled and agreed. I said, even if you're able to muster some guts and say no, I still think when I ask you a yes-no question, do you understand or is that clear, it puts a chain around your imagination and around mine too. In what way, he asked. Suppose I ask you, do you understand? Now, if you're open to my question, you start scanning your ideas to see if you understood. My question has sent you on a very specific search that forces the conversation into a very small corner. I've asked whether you understood what I said. What I have not asked you is what you think about what I said. So I have put a chain on your imagination. I stopped talking while he thought, and after a minute he said, It has never occurred to me that yes-no questions might be restrictive, but you know what? I just realized I used them with my son for exactly that purpose. He continued, There is a certain time of night when he is impossible to talk with. It's like he sinks deep into some bat cave. I'm lucky to get a grunt out of him, so I throw questions at him that are intended to restrict the conversation. These are grunt-worthy questions. Are you getting ready for bed? Or do you have homework? Arlen gave a bear-like grunt. Homework. He laughed and said, In that situation, restricting the conversation works. I agreed. Absolutely, yes-no questions aren't inherently bad. But I think they're misused if you want to invite dialogue and open the conversation up. Okay, he said. And then he asked, What did you mean when you said, when you ask a yes-no question, you put a chain around your own imagination? Oh. Okay. As soon as I form the question, do you understand, as a way of checking your understanding, I'm, in essence, inviting you to match me. 
the question's like a little test. I want to be sure your ideas are aligning with mine. So I'm not really open to your ideas. I have a box in my head, and I'm hoping you're going to fit in my box. The only thing I'm considering is my box. I've limited my own thinking. He pondered that a moment. Plus, I said, I've come to think of do you understand as a false question. False how, he asked. Well, I've come to believe that no matter what you heard me say, you have some understanding. That's probably not the same as mine, but you have your understanding. So the question, do you understand, has a false premise because the answer has to be yes. You did understand in your own way. He asked, so what would a better question be? I said, what's your understanding? He repeated, what's your understanding? He made a note. I waited. When he didn't speak, I said, I love the story you told about your son. I learned a lot about asking questions with my girls, too. You know, I always wanted to hear what they had to say, but it can be hard to get a kid to talk. <laughs> so practicing on them was great for me. I wanted to invite dialogue with them, and I want that with my clients, too, right? Well, it's no surprise. The same questions worked in both places. He repeated, What's your understanding? You got more? Well, another favorite of mine is this. How does that sound to you? He said, I can see that. A variation on that one is, I wonder what that sounds like to you. I'm inviting dialogue, and then I stop talking. He made a note. I said, you know, I'd love that the question is just a complete blank slate. A person can start their answer wherever they want. The way people answer that question always surprises me. Why, he asked. Because whatever they have to say, I could never have imagined it. He repeated the question quietly. How does that sound to you? He smiled fondly. That would have been the perfect question for me to ask Mark this past weekend. Mark was his husband. He went on. I told him an idea I had about some travel we have coming up, but I just couldn't tell if he was on board or not. I kept asking him, do you like this part? Do you like that part? But asking, how does that sound to you? That would have been a way better question to ask. Do you have more? I said, well, sometimes I'll see someone thinking about an idea and I'll just ask, what are you thinking? How can you be sure they're telling the truth? Oh, <laughs> I can't. But, you know, if for some reason what they say doesn't feel right to me, you know, I might say something like, oh, really? That's interesting. I thought you were going to say X, Y, Z. I'm inviting their response. He said, so you're not asking about people's feelings. Well, I do sometimes, I said. What made you think of that? Well, when we started talking about opening the conversations up, that's what I thought you were going to suggest, that we talk about feelings. But it hasn't been that at all. No, it hasn't, I said. But could it be he asked. Could it be what? Could talking about feelings open conversations up? Would that invite dialogue? I answered, I don't know. Would it? Well, I think it could, he said. And then he said, you know I've gotten feedback that I avoid talking about people's feelings, and I think that's fair. I do. Feelings seem personal to me. But maybe this is an opportunity. Maybe, I said. You know, in my book, asking how someone feels about something is pretty much the same as asking about how they think about something. Really? Oh, it doesn't feel that way to me. Are you saying you ask people about their thoughts and their feelings? No, not usually, I said. I tend to ask about one or the other. He asked, how do you know which one to ask about? I smiled. I follow the person's lead. Usually they will have said something like, here's how I feel about that, or... Here's how I think about that. I just use their language back to them. He thought about that and then seemed to have a new thought. He asked, is that why they call them closed-ended questions? Because when you ask one, it tends to close down the conversation? I said, huh, and open-ended questions open a conversation up? Uh, that sounds reasonable. I don't know if that's the actual case, but I'm willing to go with it. Arlen was frustrated when he began trying to invite dialogue. Forming open-ended questions was much harder than he expected. But he got better at it. And he discovered they were powerful tools for achieving the look and sound of leadership.
When I first considered writing about this topic, I worried it was too elementary. But then I went out in the world and I started listening specifically for whether people were inviting dialogue. And I find most people aren't. Now, maybe your workplace is different and maybe the people you work with are different. But most of the time, I hear people working at getting things done. They are not inviting dialogue and having open conversations. And I ask myself, why not? I find myself wondering two things. First, I wonder, do they know how to change that closed-ended question to an open-ended question? From my own personal experience, I do not think this is a small thing. When I first started coaching, I began noticing how automatically yes-no questions popped out of my mouth. And I don't think I'm alone. I had to teach myself. I had to find open-ended questions and then have them ready. Four that are the most easy for me to access are the ones that you heard spread out across the episode. I'm now going to just tell them to you one right after another. These are four open-ended questions that help me invite dialogue. What's your understanding of that? How does that sound to you? What are you thinking? What does that feel like? So, having open-ended questions ready, can you substitute a close for an open-ended question? Is it a skill that's in your tool set? That was the first thing that I wondered. The second thing that I wondered, I wondered, you know, do people even know there was an opportunity to invite dialogue. Did they know they had a choice to invite dialogue? I've actually been talking with people about this, and I've learned some interesting things about when people invite dialogue, and I've learned about how they do it. I'm going to share those tips with you, but first two things. Here's number one. Next month, the fantastic Mindy Dana will be joining me again. We're going to do another Ask the Coaches episode. The feedback from the first one in the fall was terrific. Thank you very much. And you have sent questions to us. Thank you. Keep those coming because Mindy and I will do another episode this summer. Second, gratitude. People write such kind words of appreciation. I'm so grateful. Thank you. Sometimes you send them to me in email. I love corresponding with you. You can get in touch with me through the contact button on the Essential Communications website. It's essentialcom.com. That's essentialcom with two M's, dot com. Sometimes you all write wonderful things in reviews on iTunes. I'm particularly grateful because just recently all the algorithms in iTunes changed. So your reviews and your engagement are more important than ever. Please, thank you for doing it. Please do it if you haven't. And Listen, I read what you write in your reviews, and it really touches me. From around the world, my thanks go out to, in Hungary, Tomas, in Spain, Intentandolo, in Germany, Tobias, and then here in the United States. Thanks to Alicia Brown, RJJ45, Megalapa, Vanessa Winterling, Owen090720, Taylor Made Louisiana, A. McGuire, and Amy Pham. Thank you to all of you around the world. Thanks for your reviews. Okay, back to inviting dialogue. So, when do people say they want to invite dialogue, and how do they do it? When, one of the things that I've heard people talk about is their one-on-ones. They want to do it with their direct reports. But I have also heard people say they want to do it in their own review with their boss. And I just loved that. You know, it was kind of surprising to me. And then I thought, yes, that would be perfect. Don't you want to hear what your boss has to say? So ask an open-ended question and be curious. Don't have your rebuttal ready. Just listen. And then ask another open-ended question and another. One-on-ones. Invite dialogue. Cool. Cool. Here's another one. The other day, I was talking with a client who wanted to invite dialogue in her meetings. And she said it was hard to do because her team was timid. And I think she's right. I think her team is a little timid. But when I asked her what she had tried to get this timid team to open up, what she modeled back to me was not great inviting dialogue. It was not open-ended questions. So she was like, oh, I get it. How would I do this? 
So how would you do it? When I talk to people about how they have learned to do it, I hear people tell me the exact same method that is covered in detail in an episode called Creating New Behaviors. In a nutshell, I'm going to kind of give you the how do you do it. Choose a time to practice. So, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to invite dialogue in that meeting or you know, on that agenda item or during that conversation with that person. And then prime yourself, consciously coach yourself. I want to use open-ended questions when the time is right. I'm going to try and ask five today. And then afterwards, take a minute, process what happened, how many did you do? And whatever the answer is, you have to trust your learning. You're asking the question, you're measuring performance. That's how you're going to get better over time. If you would like to raise your awareness about your communication style, this inviting dialogue idea, five other episodes you might listen to are building rapport, communicating with clarity, facilitating open dialogue, leadership and listening, questions as leadership. And also earlier I mentioned creating new behaviors. All those episodes, the whole archive is on the Essential Communications website. Use the podcast tab. When you're in the archive, if you want to continue this exploration, you might sort all the tips using the communications skills filter or the management skills filter. Either one are going to take you to some interesting places. That's it for me. Until next time, I'm Tom Henschel. Thanks so much for listening. 